theyeshiva.net. We're talking today about marital conflict, and it seems like a very ominous topic, marital conflict. And at the, the, the emails that were sent out said marital conflict resolving the unresolvable. It has a certain ominous sound to it. The truth is, marital conflict is not ominous at all. It's part of marriage, which is something, I, something I'm going to explain. Um, first, I want, I want to express what I'm not discussing tonight. We're talking about marital conflict. Marital, marriage means that there are two people who are working together to try to create something. When one spouse is being abusive or controlling, this is not what we're talking about tonight. Or when one spouse is expressing that he or she is not interested in working on the marriage, that's also not what we're going to be talking about tonight. There's, this, everything we're going to be talking about is assuming that there are two people who want to try to make this thing work. Now, that doesn't mean that if one spouse is being abusive or controlling, or one spouse is expressing that he or she is not interested in working on the marriage, that the marriage is over and it can't work. It, it, it could, and probably, I would say most of the time it really could, but we need to understand what's going on. And sometimes we need to understand where the abuse and control is coming from. Sometimes uh, what a loss of interest is really coming from a place of hopelessness or a place of fear. So there's a lot of things that could be underlying these behaviors. If this is what's happening, you probably need professional help. But if this is not what's happening, if there are two people trying to make this work and it just can't work, you just find yourself always fighting and always, it's, just, it's just not working, that's what we're going to try to talk about tonight. Um, there's going to be two categories of marital conflict that I, wa- that I want to discuss tonight. One is what I'm going to call content conflict. The other is what I'm going to call process conflict. Um, what yeshiva should we send our kids to? I want my kids to go to YSV. I want my kids to go to Ashar. And we're fighting about it. I want my Shabbos table to look a certain way. I want my Shabbos table to be tiredic and, and the very tire and Zmiris. And I want my Shabbos table to be chilled. And, and I don't lie, you know, that, that's content conflict. And these are, the, the process conflict is something different. Process conflict is, is we're, it's not so much what we're talking about, but how we're talking to each other. Or things that, that are happening in the marriage that are not about a hashgafa, a shita, a disagreement that we have, but things that are happening in the marriage that we're just, I, I, I'm getting angry at you, you're getting angry at me. Not because of any particular fight, not because of anything that's just, but just the way you talk, how you talk. Why are you, why are you looking at your phone? Why are you looking at your phone is not a content, uh, it's not a content conflict, it's a process conflict. Um, okay, marital conflict is not, this, this, is, this is so important, just, just to understand. It sounds like, marital conflict sounds like a, a, a contradiction in terms. Like if, if we have a beautiful marriage, so what's the conflict doing there? Marital conflict is not something that sometimes happens in marriage. It is something that is built into the very fabric of marriage. It's, it's, it's not like we're married and also we happen to have conflict. If, you, if we really understand what marriage is, will understand that there's conflict in marriage. Good marriages can have an equal amount of conflict as problematic marriages. I, I, I wrote the words can have, I probably should have wrote, wrote do have. I probably should have written do have. Good marriages have an equal amount of conflict as problematic marriage. It's not the conflict that makes the difference between a good marriage and a bad marriage. It's how we handle the conflict. But conflict is built into marriage. Conflict is not something that works against the marriage. It's, some, it's a critical part of the dance that makes marriage work. And I'm going I'm I'm to explain what that is. In case anybody's thinking, so, okay, conflict is built into marriage. What makes, well, you know, what, maybe God did something wrong over here. There's, there's something about marriage that without conflict, when a couple comes in to, to couples therapy, sometimes they come in with conflict. That's what you think of a couple coming to couples therapy. That you, you, you think of them coming in fighting with each other. That's most of the time how people come into couples therapy. Sometimes people come into couples therapy without conflict. And for me as a therapist, that's the scariest thing. When there's no conflict, there's usually no marriage. It means that there's distance. It means that people are not talking to each other. If If they're engaged, if they're talking to each other, there's conflict. So when a couple comes in in conflict, I know there's what to work with. It's a critical part of the dance that makes marriage work. And what, what's that dance? 
Anybody who was here last week knows why I have two little kids dancing up there. Because that's what marriage is, is the little child in me dancing with the little child in you. I want to go back to something I said in the first class. Those of you who were here heard it, but I want to just repeat it quickly. What is, let's just, just talk for a couple of minutes. What's marriage? Let's just understand what marriage is. What are we doing over here? So the question I'm going to ask is, what are the two most powerful human emotional drives, the two most powerful human emotional needs? What do I want more than anything else? Connection. I want connection. Connection is one thing. What was that? Attachment, Attachment connection. Yeah, that's a, those are the same things. Love, belonging, those are all connection. Those are all things that go under the heading of connection. I want connection, but there's something else I want equally. Acceptance. And acceptance is really connection, because if you accept me, we're connected. If you don't accept me, we're not connected. But what do I want acceptance for? I want acceptance for who I am. I want to be me. I want, I want to be me. That's the second. Besides connection, what I want more than anything else is to be an authentic expression of myself. If you take almost everything that happens in a marriage, almost every fight that takes place in a marriage, it really boils down, and, and not just marriage, in life in general, what's happened, if you look around at what's happening in the world, what's happening in families, what's happening in marriage, what's happening with little children, a, 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 look at a two-year-old. What is a two-year-old? What, what are the two things that a two-year-old wants more than anything else? They want to be connected. They want mommy. They want tati. But they also want to be themselves. And it, it, it's, it's fascinating to watch. A two, I was actually look, looking at it. It's an interaction between a parent, one of, one of my kids, and, and a, and, and a, and a three-year-old child. The parent took something away from the child. And the child started screaming and crying. I saw this on Sunday. The, 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 the child was screaming and crying. He wants it. He wants it. And the father said, no, not now. And the child was screaming and kicking and crying. And who do you think the child ran to to hug him and pick him up because he was crying? He ran to his father. The, the very person that just, just crushed my individuality right now. I, I, wanted that, I wanted that toy. And you gave it away. And you took it away. I want... And I run to Tati because Tati's the one who's going to give me that hug because I'm crying, even though I'm crying for Tati. It, it's, I want to be connected. I want to be myself. And so in a marriage, those two things really are playing themselves out more than, more than anywhere else in the universe. I come into a marriage, I want to be myself, right? Everybody says, no, 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 you don't want to be safe. You want to be connected. Okay, so coming to marriage, I want to be connected. But then what happens when that connection interferes with who I am? Now I want to be myself. And what happens if being myself interferes with the connection in the marriage? This, this, is, this is the dance in the marriage. I want, I, want to, I want to do something now, and my spouse doesn't. Okay, I could just go do my own thing. But I don't want to do my own thing, because then there's no marriage. But I want the marriage. Yeah, but if I'm in the marriage... That's, that's what happens in a marriage. So if you think about it, we're different. We are all different. And one, one of the things I'm going to talk about is really, really understanding how different we are. We come into a marriage, just, we really need to understand how different we are. If we understand what I just said, so what's a marriage? I want to, in a, in a, in a, in a marriage, I want to be as connected to you as possible. And at the same time, I very much want to be me. I don't want this, that connection to, this, to destroy who I am. Because then we, we don't have a happy marriage. I want myself to be me and I want to be connected to you. I want you to be you, but I want you to be connected to me. In a happy marriage, I'm looking out for the connection between the two of us. I'm looking out for my individuality. I'm looking out for your individuality. And th think, of, think, of those think of those, I'm going to say four things. My connection to you, your connection to me, my individuality, your individuality. If any one of those four is missing, the, the marriage is, is very painful. So the dance of marriage, I'm calling this a dance because it's, it's, it's back and forth. And which, it, 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 I, I, want, I, I, I want to be myself. I really want to be an individual, but no, 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 but I want to be connected to you. Okay, so let's connect. Yeah, but I, I really wanted to go out with my friends tonight. Um, okay, I can go out with my friends tonight, but it, and, and, it, and it just, it, but I want, it, it, there's, it's a dance. It's going back and forth. I want a certain kind of Shabbos table. 
I want my kids to go to a certain kind of yeshiva. I don't want my I want my kids to have payas behind their ears, and my spouse has trauma from payas behind their ears. I, I want I, I want my kids to go to a certain yeshiva, and my spouse absolutely of no way wants them to go to that yeshiva. You know, I I all these things are the I I could have what I want, but then we're, but then we're separated. Every single marriage has conflict. And conflict is the way that we achieve. The, the, in those conflicts, inside of those conflicts, I want to be able. So now let, let's, let's, pick a, let's pick a conflict. I'm, I really, really want my kid to go. I mean, I, I had, I said YSV and Ashar before. I've had visions in Ashar. What? I want my kid. To, what was that? Not to get one. It's insurance. Who doesn't want the driver's license? Who's, who's for my kid? I want my 16-year-old to have a driver's license. I don't want it. <laughs> uh, okay. So I want, my, I want my 16-year-old to have a driver's license. Perfect. I want my 16-year-old to have a driver's license. And 16-year-old have a driver's license? Create over my dead body. Is any 16-year-old in my house having a driver's license? Right? That, that's the... So I can put my foot down. And I can say there is no 16-year-old in my house having a driver's license. I can do that. And my spouse could say... The, the, you know, you're primitive, you're from the Stone Ages, 16-year-olds drive. When I was 16-year-olds, my parents gave me a driver's license. You, you're strangling your kid, you're choking him. All his friends are getting driver's license. What do we, what do, we do with that? Is that that's, a, that's conflict. Is anybody wrong over here? Now, if I ask, I mean, some hands are going to go up, yeah, and some hands are going to go up, yeah. <laughs> but what's happening in, inside of, if you think about that fight, what's happening there is... My, I, want, I, want, I want this home to be my home. I want, it to be, I want it to reflect who I am. I want it to reflect my values. I want it to reflect my beliefs. I want it to reflect my dreams. And I want to be connected to you. And you're the most important person in my life. But guess what? You also want the same thing. And these are all your dreams. And, and everything that's happening here is conflicting with what you want. If the goal of this fight is whether our kids should have a driver's license or not, we're in big trouble. What's the real goal of this fight? The real goal of this fight is the dance of marriage. The real goal of this fight is we have to live together for the next 80 years. Being optimistic. The, if we have to live together for the next 80 years, then what's the real goal of this fight? Can I be, in this marriage, as connected as I possibly can to you? Could you be as connected as you possibly can to me? And at the same time, can I be as authentic as I possibly can? Can I be myself? Can you be yourself? This sounds insanely impossible, right? Welcome to marriage. This, this is the dance of marriage. If we can navigate, if we can look at this fight, at this conflict as... The, the, the outcome of this conflict needs to be not whether our kid is having a driver's license or not, even though that's, that, that's the content over here. That's what we're fighting about. Way more important than that, way more important than that is what our marriage is going to look like for the next 80 years if we can navigate this and dance together in the right way. Can I be me and at the same time help you be you? In other words, if I'm coming into this with the understanding that over my dead body is any 16-year-old driving in my house, but your feelings are just as strong. He's 18. What? He's 18. He's 18. Come on. <laughs> um, okay. I, I'm just going to say this. I'm not going to dwell on it. It really needs a whole two-hour lecture in and of itself, but let's just, just put it out there. In order for me to make room for all of you, I first need to make room for all of me. Even those parts of me that are having trouble making room for you. How in the world could anybody want a Shabbos table like this? We're talking about Trump at the Shabbos table? Really? There's no way I'm, I'm going to have anybody talking about Trump at my Shabbos table. And then the other side of that is there's no way I'm having a Shabbos table where we have to sit and just the Vartars, the Vartars, the Vartars, like my father used to say, and it drives me crazy, and I, I can't take this anymore. 
and I want my kids to be chilled and I just want them to enjoy and if they want to talk about Trump, let them talk about Trump. There's, there's in or, so what's going to happen here is I have to make room for a person, for a human being that wants that kind of Shabbos table. And I have to make room for a human being that wants that, wants that kind of Shabbos table. If I'm going to make room for that human being, I have to make room for the parts of me that are having trouble making room for you. There's so much more to say on that, but just think of that. If you have the slide, just take it out tonight and just look at it again. Okay, I want to talk about something, a concept called subjective reality. Um, that is fundamental in marriage. According to John Gottman, this is, if there's a fight in a marriage, then without subjective reality, you almost cannot resolve this fight. The, 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 the fights in marriages need a sense of subjective reality. Subjective reality means that our reality is, sub is subjective. It's, it's my reality. I look at things my way. You look at things your way. We see things differently. And you could have two people looking at the same thing, and we do this all the time. You could have two people looking at the same thing, they see different things. I'm sure you've seen this. This is all over. You see, the, see that picture? Who sees a woman? And who, see, who sees a guy playing a trombone? Saxophone. <laughs> I see a trombone. No, saxophone. I'm sorry, you're right. This, we look at things, and this is, this is just like a cute little thing, but in life, in general, we see reality we see reality subjectively. Why we see reality subjectively is something I, I want to dwell on it a little bit. When a husband and wife are arguing over what happened, they are usually both telling the truth. Something I always tell couples, even, even what happened yesterday. Yesterday, when Yankee was walking out the door and, and you, you, you made that comment about his Rebbe, why did you make that comment about his Rebbe? Now he's going to go to Yeshiva, he's going to tell them, I, I didn't make that comment about it. I don't know what you're talking about. I did not say that. I, they're fighting. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Who's lying? Who's telling the truth? And what I tell couples all the time is, I, I, I'm sure, I'm convinced, that if we t attach a lie detector to each of you, you'd both be telling the truth. You'd both be telling the truth. We see the world from a certain place. And I want to, I want, it's so important to understand that place. Uh, take a look at this picture. It, it, spe it speaks for itself. This is how we see the world. This is what the world looks like. Everybody got it? It, it took me about 20 seconds. <laughs> so. What? All, all the wives need to explain it to your husbands. So uh, <laughs> he's looking at the world, and he, everything he sees in the world is through a certain perspective. And that perspective has this big thing right in front of it that's on his nose. This is how we all look at the world. No two people see the world in the same way. Um, there's some, before we get into what makes this so hard, it sounds like, okay, we're different. We see the world differently. We look at the world differently. Okay, so fine. So you saw that and I saw that. We have different realities and, and everything's okay. It's not that simple. We get married because we want to be connected. We get married because we want to be understood. We get married because we want somebody who's just going to know my soul. So, but we all have existential loneliness. We're all, we're all very lonely. We're different and that, that some, what the philosophers call existential loneliness. We're just all deep inside of us lonely. And, you know, the neshama is, is there all alone inside of us. Nobody, nobody, nobody really knows what's going on inside of me. Nobody. Besides me. It's a very lonely place. And we get married hoping that, oh, now... Now I have a soulmate. Now I have somebody who's just going to get me. And if they don't, it is so lonely. Marriage cannot work without a sense of subjective reality, but the existence of subjective reality means that I am exist existentially alone. The realization that a marriage will never eliminate my existential loneliness, it won't. Over the years, as you talk to each other and as you explain yourself to each other, you'll begin to understand each other more and more. The existential loneliness 
goes away slowly, but there will always be something that's not understood. The realization that marriage will never eliminate my existential loneliness can be unbearably painful for some people, for most people. Not having my subjective reality validated is the experience of being alone. So what do we do? As couples, our subjective reality is completely different. If I'll never be fully understood, we will always be different. I will always have to tell you what I need. We spoke about that last week. But there's something that we can do that, that begins to touch, to, to pull away this existential loneliness. If I can validate your subjective reality, if I can say to you, I really don't know you, I really don't, but tell me about yourself. And then you tell me something, and it makes no sense to me. Like, really? That bothers you? Like, when she said something, when, when, when she made that comment to you, it, 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 it bothered you? No, it wouldn't bother me. All of a sudden, you feel lonely. But what if I say to you, the fact that it wouldn't bother me is irrelevant to what's going on inside of you. I want to know if that bothered you, if that comment bothered you, you were hurt by something, or maybe something I said hurt you, and I don't understand why it hurt you, but you're telling me it hurt you? That means so much to me. Wow, if that hurt you, I, I, okay, I'll be much more careful next time. I don't want to say things that hurt you, or that your boss said something and it really, really insulted you. I get it, that must be so hard for you. I want to understand, as much as I possibly can, I want to understand your experience, I want to validate your experience. When we do that, we kind of reduce our existential loneliness. If you think about that, when we get in, you'll see where we're going when it comes to a fight and what we're looking for in conflict and why conflict is so important. Because conflict is that place. Without conflict, we don't get to validate each other's existential loneliness. We don't get to validate each other's subjective reality. A marriage without conflict, th there's no way we're connecting. Uh, Unless we're exactly, perfectly, exactly alike and there is no differences. If there's a marriage without conflict, it means that you're not taking your subjective reality and showing it to me, and I'm not taking my subjective reality and showing it to you, and we're just not connecting. That's what a marriage without conflict is. I want, I want to go through quickly some of the reasons why we experience different reality. I'm going to go through these terms, confirmation, but you can Google any one of these, but I want to spend a little, just a little bit of time explaining each one. Every one of these is so important and plays, plays a role in almost every single marriage. Now, I'm going to go through, what I'm going to do after I go through these, I'm going to go through, so what are the rules? So how do, how do we have conflict? How do we fight? What, what are the rules of fighting? I, I want to go through that. And I want to show you how a fight plays out. But there are certain things that we need to understand before we even get there. And one of those things is we need to understand that we're entering, we're entering into an arena where we are completely, completely different, and that's okay. Okay, now let's fight. Now let's disagree. Um, the first is confirmation bias, fundamental attribution error, perceived punctuation of events, mood congruency effects. Um, I'm going to go through each one individually. Confirmation bias. Anybody care of confirmation bias? Confirmation bias means, let's say I get... Uh, let's say I think I'm stupid. That's just my thing. I know that because you know, my teacher in second grade told me that, my mother told me that, my brother told me that, I'm stupid. Now, that's, that is my belief. It's, it's, it's an ingrained belief in me. And I take a test and I get a 98. I'm going to say, wow, I really got lucky. That was a lucky test. A few days later, I take another test and I get a 97. That, that teacher, everyone knows that teacher gives easy tests. Take another test, it's 100. Everyone got 100 on that test. And I, and I have like 10 tests like that. And each test, I have a really good reason why. Yeah, that one I really, really studied hard for. But, and then I get a 47 on a test. I say, see, I told you I was stupid. And all that, but this 47 proves that all those other good marks, it was just luck. Because this 47 showed it. Whatever my bias is, whatever my belief is, I will find confirmation for that. Now... Sitting next to me, there's another guy who really, really believes he's smart. He, he thinks he's brilliant. And he just got a 47 on a test. The, one, the same one that I got a 98 on. He got a 47. That was, that was, the test was not fair. All the questions were unfair. Then he takes another test and he gets a 52. You know, that teacher, the way he marks is impossible. Then he gets a, a, a 61. You know, everybody, got, everybody did bad on this one. And then he gets a 97. I told you I was smart. I told you. I found confirmation. 
the way confirmation bias looks, we look at this picture. Have you ever seen those toys where it's like a, it's like a ball with a bunch of shapes, holes on the ball? And you, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a baby toy, and you have to take the shape, let's say it's the squares, the triangles, the circles, and the baby has to take the square and put it into the square holes, and the circles and take it into, put it into the circle holes. And no, no shape will fit into any other hole. <coughs> and when you're done, you have, you have a ball full of all the shapes. Now imagine you had squares, circles, triangles, little pieces, but the ball only had squares. So you could only get the squares into the ball. At the end of the day, you'll have a ball with a whole bunch of squares in it. And somebody looking at it will say, oh, there, there were probably only squares. No, there's a whole bunch of other stuff there. It just didn't fit. Confirmation bias means we have certain beliefs. And our brain will only allow those beliefs in. If you're looking at a brain with, that will only allow the squares in. It will only allow those beliefs in. So now... If I believe, let's say I believe my husband really doesn't care. Or I believe my wife really doesn't care. I really believe my spouse really doesn't care about me. Or my, my spouse is not interested in me. Work, work is more important to him. Or, work, or, or, or her friends are more important to her. Or the other way around. And on Sunday, so let's pick on the wife now. On Sunday, my husband spent the whole day Sunday with me. And on Monday, he came home really, really early from work because he knew I really wanted to be home from work. And on Tuesday, he left late because he wanted to help me with carpool. And on Wednesday, he came home at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and went back to work at 4 because he knew that there was something, you know, I had, to, had, to, had something at night and I needed, I needed his help during the day. And at thir on Thursday, he really blew it. He came home 10 o'clock at night and told me some crazy excuse that he had to go late to work and really, then he, that proves that he doesn't care. That proves the whole week, and the whole week, yeah, yeah what you did on Sunday, and what you did on Monday, and what you did on Tuesday, you're laughing, but this, this is, <laughs> this happens all the time. This happens all the time, and, and then, and the other spouse, and I, I picked on the wife now, but this goes both ways, and, and the other spouse saying, well, what, about, what about Sunday, what about Monday, what about Tuesday, what about Wednesday? The, the, what happened today proves that Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday was, you just got lucky. It wasn't real. It wasn't real. If it was real, you would have done this Thursday. That, that, that is confirmation bias. It's one of the most powerful forces in marriage. It's really one of the most powerful forces in marriage, especially, especially marriages that are more than five or ten years old. Uh, just something that happens in marriage, I think it's very important to understand, in the first year of marriage, we're just getting to know each other. We're really young. If anybody here is in the first year of marriage, I'm, uh, you know, uh, we, we've all been there, so I'm talking to all of us. But we're really young, and we really, we're just trying to form our opinions. 20 years later, we're older, we're wiser, right? But our opinions have been formed already. It's, it's done. In that first year of marriage, when we really didn't know anything about marriage, we didn't know anything about each other, we knew very little about life. I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about other people in the Shannon China, right? But we really didn't know much about now, now, now somebody, somebody says, you know, I'm in my 40s, I'm in my 50s, I'm in my 60s, I know about life. I know about life. I wasn't born yesterday. I know my spouse. The knowledge that you have about your spouse so often is based on confirmation bias. It's based on opinions that were formed in the first year of marriage, and they're solidified. And now there's a, there's a, there's a square, and only things that match those beliefs will go into that. And it's very hard to see outside of that. In conflict, it's critical to be able to try to step out of confirmation bias. To be able to take, to take a step out and see, is there something here that maybe this belief, this particular belief, is something that I formed many, many years ago. Um, the second thing is something called fundamental attribution error. Fundamental attribution error means 
I'm not going to read that. Fundamental attribution error means that when I, when I look at you, I see, I see your behavior. I don't see what's going on inside of you. I, all I see is your behavior. Based on your behavior, I have to figure out what's going on inside of you. So I see you smiling a certain way. I see you take, doing a certain action. I see you, I see you forgetting. Um, let, let's say you have one spouse. And, and, and the, only, the only internal world that I have access to is my own. So everything I'm going to look at is based on my own internal world. So let's say I'm, I'm a forgetful person. And my spouse forgets nothing. So my spouse asked me to, to, you know, on your way home from work, can you pick up, you know, go to the grocery, just pick up some eggs and some milk and some stuff. And I, I just forgot. And I come home. Why did I forget? So I, lo I look at my spouse's behavior and say, the, if, if he forgot or if she forgot, it must be, it must be. And then we, we attribute something to it. it. Must be he doesn't care. If he really cared, if she really cared, she wouldn't have forgotten. If a boss would ask her, then that, you know, that she wouldn't forget. So I, I attribute something to the behavior. If, if she's looking at her phone, he's looking at his phone, it must be he doesn't care about me. There's, we attribute, we, we attribute, we look at behavior, and then we attribute meaning to that behavior. And sometimes we're right, most of the time we're wrong. Most of the time, you know, the, the, the question, what were you thinking when you did that? What, what was he thinking? What was she thinking? The answer usually is she wasn't or he wasn't. There's, there's just, we, we attribute a certain reason to that. Um, she must be a bad-tempered person. The reason why I, I use this, the reason why I use this, this, this picture was because I had a client once, a couple that came to me, and I, I say this before every, every class that I give, I'm going to use examples of clients that came to me. Uh, they're never accurate. I just need to put that out there. Um, I change things. I change the story. I change there's so many things that have changed, but the story is true. But I just need to, just need to say that. So I <clears throat> had a couple that came to me. Um, before they came to me, I had spoken to the wife's therapist and the husband's therapist. And the wife's therapist said that the husband, the, the husband's therapist said that the wife is probably borderline. Um, she has, she, she's just, she's bad tempered. She's emotionally dysregulated. It's, she's an impossible person to live with. And the husband's therapist, the, 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 the husband's, ther the wife's therapist said, he's arrogant, obnoxious, abusive, and she doesn't stand a chance in this marriage. Okay. <laughs> now, there was another piece over here. I knew this guy. He was my client years before. Five years earlier, he was my client as a teenager. The nicest, greatest guy you could know. He was such a sweet guy. And I, I didn't get it. So when they walked in, I was thinking, she must be borderline. The other one doesn't get it. I mean, she, she just must be borderline. She must be, she has this temper. And she... So I, I, in the first session, the, whatever they were talking, I met with him, I met with her. Two completely different stories. In session number four, when I meet with the two couples together, when I meet with the, the two spouses together, about halfway through the session, she's trying to explain something, and the guy who, again, I, I had known him for like over a year and a half, and thought he was the sweetest guy, the guy goes something like this, to a comment that she makes. She completely fell apart. She completely fell apart, became emotionally dysregulated, started yelling at him, completely fell apart. And it happened again, about 10 minutes later. That, and, it, and suddenly realized that for a year and a half, this guy had been doing it to me. Same thing. I would say something to him and he would go. That, that, that same motion, that same eye movement. And it never bothered me. It never meant anything to me. It was just something he did. I would tell him my opinion about something, he would go. Okay, it was, to me it was almost like cute. And for her, I'm not going to go into the detail, but this, this brought back very, very, very painful trauma from childhood. 
this was her mother, this was her father, this was her older siblings, this was, this, this was her childhood, right there in that moment. And what he did to her in those moments completely destroyed her. She didn't, she didn't stand a chance. The fundamental attribution, fundamental attribution error means that there's something happening here. I'm attributing, oh, she lost her temper, she fell apart. Yeah, she's borderline. No, this woman, this woman was so not borderline. But there was something else going on, something really, really painful. He was triggering her PTSD. He was triggering her whole childhood. He was triggering so much pain inside of her. <coughs> Perceived punctuation of events. Now, I want you to just absorb all of this, because the things I'm describing now, I might be giving you dramatic examples, but they ha and sometimes they happen in marriages in a very dramatic way. They happen in every single marriage, every single day even in good marriages. This happened all the time. Perceived punctuation of events. To, normally we think what came first, the chicken or the egg, is, is, is a question that has to have an answer. In other words, either the chicken came first or the egg came first. We just don't know which one came first. What if neither one came first? What if it's endless? What if there's an endless loop over here? When something happens, where did it start? So a guy comes home from work, walks into the kitchen, and completely ignores his wife, and goes for the mail, goes to the fridge, walks out of the kitchen. And his wife walks, walks in, follows him and says, hello, you know, you just walk into the house, you don't say hello to me, nothing? You know, that was, that was really not nice of you. And he says, you know, I didn't start this. So what are you talking about? Remember that text she sent me at three o'clock this afternoon? That was really, really, I, I could really tell you all the details of the story, but we'll, <laughs> we gotta move. You remember, remember that text she sent me at three o'clock this afternoon? That, you know how hurtful that was? That was disgusting what you did. And she said, at three o'clock this afternoon, I sent you a text because did you see, you remember the, the message, the phone message you left me today at, what, at lunchtime? And he said, the message I left you at lunchtime do you remember what, when I walked out of the door, what you said to me? And she said, no, I said, I, I said that to you because you know what you said to me when, we, when, we, when you got up this morning? I said, yeah, you know, I, you know why I said that to you when we got up this morning? Last night, okay, I, 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 we can keep going here. Where, where did this start? And if we keep going, we'll be, we'll be Shaver Brach this week and maybe even childhood. You look at an event and one spouse is saying in a conflict, what happens in conflict is everybody is saying, I am right. Look, look, the proof is in the pudding. Look right there. Look, look at the facts. And that's what happens. You have two people looking and seeing, the, what, what facts are we looking at? What, what facts are you looking at? Are you looking at these facts? No, I'm looking at these facts. Yeah, but I'm looking at these facts. I'm looking at, the, what facts are we looking at? And again, this happens all the time in a marriage. There's, there is no event in any marriage that is an isolated event. There's no event in a marriage that's an isolated event. Every event is based on a history. And the longer the marriage, the longer the history. Um, now just keep all these things in mind. and just, It's piling up. And now a husband and wife are getting into a conflict and they're trying to decide who's right and who's wrong. Are you, are you kidding? Confirmation bias, perceived punctuation of events, fundamental attribution errors. What I'm trying to do is put a lot of doubt in all of you, in each of you, as to I am 100% right. Really? Just, just what? what and according to this, a perceived punctuation of events, even the definition of right and wrong is is com there is there is no right and wrong. There is there is. It's not even, we don't know who's right and wrong. There is none. It depends where you start. Where did the story start? Okay. The next thing is mood congruency of, of effects. Our current, our current mood often impacts our memory. This is really important. And we don't realize this. This happens to all of us. If I'm in a good mood, I will remember happy things. If I'm in a bad mood, I will remember negative things. If I'm talking to my wife about a vacation that we had, and I say, 
It wasn't that, it was so, I had such a nice time. It was such a beautiful vacation. Remember when we, we went we doing the hiking in the mountains and then the beach was just so gorgeous. And she says, yeah, the food in the restaurant was really, was really bad. That restaurant, I don't know, that, that restaurant was just such a terrible restaurant. And they, they, they came late and the, the food was cold. And the, wa the water was, was, was I, know, I couldn't step into the water on the beach. I wanted to go swimming in the beach, but it was impossible. It was too wavy. Now I get really hurt and insulted and angry. I just spent $2,000 on a vacation and, and took off from work. And, and, and she's complaining about the food. And the Three weeks later, we might have the exact same conversation. And my wife might say, it was, it was such a nice vacation. I really, really had such a beautiful time with you. And I say, the plane trip was a disaster. And, and my wife's saying, that's, that's all he remembers? We had this beautiful week together. What's going on over here? And what's going on over here is something called mood congruency effects. The mood that I'm currently in right now will affect which things I remember. And, and so we could, two people could be talking about the same event and could have memories of the exact same event and have different memories of those events. Um, this affects memory the other way also. If I'm in a bad mood when something happens or I'm in a good mood when something happens, my memory of the event that's happening now, if, if, if it's Tuesday at three o'clock, something takes place and my wife and I, one of us is in a good mood, one of us is in a bad mood, What's, what's, we, we may remember different aspects of what took place. Scary, no? This is scary. <laughs> and we will perceive the event, com the event completely differently, and we will talk about it completely differently, and then we're going to come into the therapist's office and say, yelling, that that's not what happened, that's not what happened. They're both true, we just pulled out different events. Um, we also have different coping skills from childhood. That coping skills, the first, in childhood, the first 20 years of our life are years that we, if you think about it, I'm going to say it very dramatically, it doesn't have to be this dramatic, it could be, on a, but it's all about survival. It's all about survival. So all about survival means, might mean something really dramatic, that if I don't behave I'm going to get smacked and molested or beaten, or all about survival might mean if I grow up in a beautiful home. Um, I want that cookie for dessert. I want the ice cream for dessert. And there's only one way I'm gonna get ice cream for dessert. I, I need to manipulate. I need to, I'm not in control. I'm in control of nothing. I'm a small child. I'm at the mercy of the adults all around me. And I'm, I'm saying this in a beautiful home, in a beautiful home with a beautiful upbringing, with wonderful parents. I am at the mercy of the people around me and I need to make this work for me as a child. Children develop skills that just make it work for them. So if I live in a home where expressing certain emotions just kind of doesn't work. So I'll learn, okay, that, that doesn't work. Those expressing those emotions don't work. If I live in a home where expressing certain emotions does work, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put on those emotions. I'll express those emotions. I'll make sure <clears throat> to create that kind of environment. It, it, I, I work to create the environment to create a reality that works for me. And then we get married. And all the, everything that we learned how to do for 20 years is to survive no longer applies. But we're still doing it. We're still, we're still, we spend the first 20 years of our life trying to figure out how to make life work for us. And then we spend the next 70, 80 years trying to undo that because it's really messing up our marriage and messing up our relationship with our kids and messing us up at work. We're not kids anymore. And, and so often you see a child who grew up in a home where emotional expression, this is, this is something that's one of the most common outcomes of this, certain emotional expressions would just, it didn't work. It, it, and I'm not talking about an emotionally negligent home. And emotionally, it's just those kind of things just didn't work. And we, we didn't do mushy things in our home. We didn't, we didn't say, I love you. It just didn't work in our home. And now we're coming into a marriage. I, I don't need that protection anymore. I don't need... We live very often what's happening in marriage is we're coming, we're building a whole different reality for ourselves coming out of the first 20 years. The work of marriage very often is I, I, we need to be able to see 
what was happening in, in, in our homes that may be impacting what we're doing right now. The question, was, the question was, should human beings just do this deep dive? Look at all these bullet points, right up front, I guess, right at the beginning of the marriage. Okay, let's, 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 we have a lot of stuff that we need to do, let's do a deep dive, right? I, I think the answer to that is marriage is that deep dive. And the question is, are, are we, if, if, we're, if we're being married correctly, marriage is the deep dive. Marriage is that place where all her childhood stuff gets worked out if we're being married, married correctly. And it's not like, okay, I need to go, we all need, it sounds like we all need to go to therapy for 20 years before we go to marriage. Okay, I was, I was a kid for 20 years, now I'm gonna go to therapist for 20 years, work out all these issues, and then get married. And I'm not sure 20 years will do it. <laughs> marriage is that. A healthy marriage, that's why I said before, marital conflict is the place where we work out all that stuff. We, we really discover ourselves in marriage. Ma marriage is, a, is a, the most powerful aspect of marriage is not just connection, which it is. That's only half the story. The other half of the story is self-discovery because in order to be really... Connection and self-discovery are two sides of the same coin. If I really, really want to be connected to you, I really have to discover who I am. And if I really want to discover who I am, I really have to be connected to you. It, it's, that's the dance of marriage. So you're saying, should we do this deep dive before marriage? No, marriage is the deep dive, if we do it correctly. If, if, if you're going into a marriage thinking you're going to avoid the deep dive, it's, you can do that, but then, you know, you'll, you'll be in a marriage with trouble, you'll end up in a therapist's office, and then you, then you do the deep dive. So you can just do the deep dive together with your spouse, or do it afterwards. Uh, if you're aware, so the question was, if you're aware, that your confirmation bias is off. Yeah, is there anything the, the, uh, I'm aware that the confirmation bias is off. What, what would be the tools to help me work that through? Yeah. Over here, because this is a couple's workshop, I would like to say your spouse can be that tool. Putting, put, taking confirmation bias and putting it on the table, putting it out there, verbalizing it, verbalizing it to your spouse. Say, saying that you know, I'm, I'm having a really hard time because I'm, I'm just kind of seeing you a certain way. I really don't want to see you that way. And if the spouse's response is, well, then just stop doing that, you know, th then, then I hope this, your spouse is listening, right? <laughs> because that val validation of that, if your spouse's response to that is, I hear you, I, I did notice that. And... I, I could imagine what's happening. Like every time I do this, you see it that way. Yeah, that's what's happening. Every time you do this, I see it that way. You're, you're bringing it out into the open. You're saying it, you're putting it, the verbalizing it is one of the most powerful tools you can use. To, to, to see. What you're doing is you're separating from it. When you take thoughts that are swimming around in your head and, and just exploding inside of you, and you don't know what to do with them, and you verbalize them, you put them out there, you talk about them with somebody else, now the thoughts are not here, now the thoughts are here. And you could actually see it, you could talk about it, you create distance, you're creating distance between yourself and the confirmation bias. That many of these problematic thoughts that we're talking about, the solution is not necessarily to get rid of the thoughts. Not always can we do that. The solution is to create a different kind of relationship with the thoughts. If I can take the thoughts and put them over here and notice it, and maybe even laugh at it and say, okay, there goes my brain again. That's what, that's what my brain is doing. And spouses can help each other do that. If they're, okay. What I want to go through now is how do, we, how, do we, how do we recover from a process conflict and, how do, we have a, and how, how do we fight? Now that we had all this, what does a fight look like? Okay. Um, okay, so let, let, now let's have a fight. Let, let's do it. So we, there's, there's, there's two kinds of fights that I mentioned before. There's what we're calling... What we're calling a process fight, and which is usually what you think of as a fight and a content fight. I'm gonna do the process first. Content would be we're fighting over something. There's something, there's an issue. The, the license would be a content fight. Um, a process fight is something happened and there are hurt feelings. It's, it's, we had a conversation in a way that really, feelings were really hurt. Imagine, the following scenario. 
Um, <clears throat> there's a husband who every Sunday, let's say, goes biking with a couple of friends for a few hours. And one Sunday, his two friends are not available. And he tells his wife that, you know, they're not available, but uh, I decided I'm just going to, I'm just going to, you know, I really need it. I just need it. I, I, I can't go a Sunday without biking. And uh, it just makes a whole different, I, I'm just going to go. And she says to him, you know, you're by yourself. Now, I'm, uh, again, I said every story, I, I don't report accurately. So I'm not going to give you the exact details of the story, but the story happened. So the husband says to the wife, the husband says to the wife, I really, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go. And the wife says, your friends aren't available. You'll be biking in the mountains by yourself. I know where you go biking. It's all by yourself. It's, it's, you'll be the only one there. You, you, should not, you should not be going. You know, first, first of all, if, if your friends are not there. You know, maybe, 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 maybe the, I think this Sunday you should be spending with your family. And also it's dangerous. You know, the, you don't, 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 don't go by yourself biking. You, you, don't, you don't go by yourself biking. And he says to her, Come with me. What? Come with me. That, that would be a really nice, that would, <laughs> that would be really nice. That's not what happened in this case. We changed the names. And he said, he says, no, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go. And she says, you should not be going by yourself biking. You, that, that, that's, that's, not, that, that's very dangerous, and you should not be going by yourself biking. And he says, I'm going biking by myself. I'm a two-year-old baby. I'm going to go biking by myself. And, and she gets very angry at him. <clears throat> says, that, 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 you know, you have, you have one Sunday. Your friends are not here. You should, not, you should be spending more time with your family. And, and you're going to go out. This is dangerous. You, have, you, you should not be going out by yourself biking. And he says, you know what? I, I just, I, my mother tells me what to do. My wife doesn't tell me what to do. And he storms out of the house and goes biking. Uh, okay. Comes back. And there's a big fight. After he comes back from the biking, there's a huge fight. And they're not actually, they're actually not even talking to each other until they get to the therapist's office a few days later. What happened there? They're in a fight. This is a real fight. This is a process fight. This is a process fight. There's no sheet, there's no hashkafa, there's, no, there's, there's nothing that they're trying to <clears throat> you know, figure out what's right, what's wrong. This, this hurt feelings here. What really happened? And when we pull it apart, and I'm telling you what, what, what happens. I'm just, I want to give you a glimpse of what could happen in a therapy room with a fight like this. But this can happen at home in your kitchen also. And this, this is really where, this is what needs to happen. When we pull this apart, I, I'll ask her what was going on in your mind, what was going on in, in his mind. What was going on for her is two things. She, what was going on for her was, I got really, really excited. When I heard his two friends were, were not available, I got really excited. It was like, whoa, he's going to be home Sunday. I'm so happy. And then he tells me he's going by himself. And two thoughts went through my mind. I just, my heart just, just did a nosedive because I felt really, really lonely. Now I'm, I'm going to be, he's not home Sunday. And the second thing, I was terrified. It's really dangerous. He's going by himself, who knows where, for three hours, riding his bike. Anything could happen. I, 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 I'm terrified. She's expressing two thoughts. Loneliness and fear. That's what she's expressing. Now, now it, and that, that's, also, that, that's what her internal process was. Loneliness and fear. That's not what came out of her mouth. What came out of her mouth was, you should be home, you should be home. It's dangerous. Don't go there. That's what she said. Those are the words. And what did he hear? And I'm, I'm going to do this without going into each person's childhood, but childhood plays a huge role. All those things that we said before play, play an enormous role. Because when I talked to him about what he heard, what he heard was, you have no right 
is what he heard. When I, when I processed with him, what was going through his mind? What he heard was, you have no right. Your Sunday doesn't belong to you. It belongs to your family. And you have no right just to go and take off all by yourself. You have a responsibility to your kids. You have a responsibility to your family. Right? And when he heard that, he's thinking to himself, I took off from work Friday. I, took off, I was home the whole day Shabbos. I let my wife sleep till, till, till 1 a.m., till 1, 1 p.m. I, 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 you know, give me the few three hours. And there's a, there's a lot of childhood here also. A very controlling mother, a very, that, that, all that stuff always plays, it plays a role. So what he heard was, number one, he heard, your time is not your own. I'll tell you how to spend your time. That's what he heard. The second thing he heard was, you're a baby. You're a big baby. You can't go by yourself. I'll tell you where you can go, when you can go, how you can go. Right? You cannot go by yourself with a bike. That's what he heard. Babies don't go by themselves with a bike. What he heard was, her, it, the wife expressed internally, what she, what she thought she was saying was, I'm so lonely and, 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 and I'm scared. I'm just really worried for you. That's what she thought she was saying. When the words came out of her mouth and went to him, he heard, you're not a good father, you never spend time with your kids, and you know, I'll tell you what, what's called dangerous, what's called not dangerous, because you, you can't take care of yourself. That's what he heard. When he responded to her, so, so how did he respond to her? He said to her, before, the, before it turned into a fight, at this point there was no fight. If you go back to the conversation, when there's a fight in the marriage, you try to go back, where did we part ways? What happened? Where was that point where we just kind of lost each other? She said something to him. There was no fight. She said, you know, don't go. And, and it's dangerous. He said, there's nothing wrong with going, and I, I really need to, to go by. No fight yet. What, she heard, what did she hear? When he said to her, I, re, I really, I, I'm, I'm going to go. I, I, you know, that's not a, it's not dangerous, and, and, and you know, I really was thinking about this all week. I'm going to go. It's no fight yet, but what did she hear? What did he mean to say? When he answered his wife, I'm going to go, what he meant to say was, I really need to go biking, desperately. I desperately need to go biking. And, you know, I'll be safe. I'll take care of myself. I, I wear a helmet. I, I'm, I take all the precautions. I, you really don't have to worry. That's what he meant to say. That's not what he said. He said, I, I, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's ridiculous. I'm going to go. What do you think she heard? Remember, she expressed, I'm so lonely. At least she thought she expressed, I'm so lonely and, 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 and I'm so scared. You know what she heard? I couldn't care less. That's what she heard, I couldn't care less. I don't care about your loneliness and I don't care about your fear. I'm going biking. That's not what he meant to say. He meant to say, I really need this biking trip and I promise you I'll take care of myself. That's not what he said. That's not the words that came out of his mouth. So now you have a husband and wife. She thought that she said, I'm, I'm lonely and scared. He heard, you're a big baby and you're not a good father. Then he said, he thought that he said, you know, I'm an adult and I'll take care of myself, don't worry. And, and but that's, not what, that's not what came out of his mouth. What she heard was, I don't care about you. So now, now, now the anger starts and now it picks up. And now they're in a fight. And what I, now, now why are you reacting to that? Why are you reacting to me this way? And now they're yelling at each other and screaming, and they're not talking to each other. What I ask a couple in this situation is, imagine, imagine that, I, so let's say I'll, I'll turn to the guy first. I'll say, imagine that your wife said to you, I'm so lonely and I'm so scared. And you said to her, I don't, Give up. I don't care. I just don't care about you. Imagine you said that to her. Would you understand her reaction? And of course his response was, yeah, but I didn't say that. <laughs> I, I, you have to survive yeah. <laughs> so, so after he gets over the fact that, yeah, but that's not what she said and that's not what I said. I said, that's not the question. I want you to imagine that your wife said to you, I'm so lonely and I'm so scared. And you said, I don't care. 
Would you understand her reaction? Would you understand what happened to her? Would you understand why she's not talking to you for three days? He said, yeah, if that's what happened. That's not what happened. No, no. Would you understand? Yeah. Okay. In her mind, that's what happened. That was her experience. That was her subjective reality. That's what she lived through. And can you validate that that was her experience? I know it didn't happen. I know it. We all know it didn't happen. But could you validate that that was the experience that she went through? That was the world that she was living in when she stopped talking to you. Could you understand that? If that, if that was her experience of life in that moment, could you get it? Yeah, I got it. Let me, let me just finish this, because this, now I'm going to pick on him. Now we're going to go the other way. Now we're going to pick on her. And what I would say to the wife is, imagine you told your husband, imagine you turned to your husband, and instead of saying, I'm so lonely and scared, you said to him, you're a big baby, and you're a lousy husband, and the fact that you took off work Friday, and you let me sleep till 12 o'clock on Shabbos, it means absolutely nothing to me. And, and you have to be home Sunday with the kids because I decided. And you know what? You're, you, you're so impulsive and so not responsible that I, I don't trust you. You're like a five-year-old on a bike, and I don't trust you to ride a bike by yourself. Imagine you said that to your husband. Would you understand his response? Would you understand, him, would you understand where he's coming from? And of course the wife said, yeah, but I didn't say that to him. No, no. What if you did? Would you understand his response? The answer is, yeah. I'll say, that's what he heard. That's exactly what he heard. Once you understand each other's subjective reality, once you get to that place of, oh, so that's the world you were living in when you started yelling at me. That's, that's the experience that you were in. And then, oh, so that's the experience that you were in. At that point, fight's over. The fight is over. Because all... The goal of recovery from a fight is not to figure out who's right and who's wrong. It's not to figure out, it's not to figure out what happened. And, and it's to figure out what was, it's, it's to figure out what happened inside our subjective realities. What, if we start talking like that after a fight, if that's what we do, if our focus, okay, we just got into a big fight, we just got really angry at each other, okay, what was your subjective reality? What was my subjective reality? What was your experience? What was my experience? Let me try to explain to you where I was. Let me try to explain. Almost always, almost always, very rarely have I seen this other, otherwise. I mean, there are, there are jerks out there. There are bad people out there. But 99.9% .9 of the time, when a husband and wife get angry at each other in a process fight, it's because each one was living inside a different experience in that moment. And if, when you get into a fight, you pause and you say, wait a second, let's, let's really understand the experience that we were each in. Oh, okay, so that, that was your experience? Okay, that was your When that happens, and then it happens again, and then it happens again, and every time it happens, we have this kind of conversation, guess what's going to happen? We're going to start talking to each other like that. Three months from now, if, if this is what happens, when, when the wife feels the same way, she's going to say, I'm really lonely and scared. And then he might say, now let's say he still wants, that doesn't mean, oh, you're lonely and scared, so I'm going to stay home. It might. Or it might mean that he's going to address, he may still want to go biking, but he's going to address her loneliness and address her fear. That's what he has to do. The conversation, maybe he'll, he'll try to reassure her. Maybe he'll try to explain. They, they can ha but, they're, but they're having a conversation about real things. They're not having a conversation, they're, they're, they're talking about the issues. And what are the issues? Her loneliness, her fear, and his need to get out and, 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 and do this. And they'll, they'll try to navigate it, but now they're talking about the real issues. They're, they're still in a conflict now. now. Now we have a conflict that's, now, now, this is, now this is a conflict that could really work in a marriage. The first scenario was, a, was, was not a conflict that could work in a marriage. That wasn't the dance of marriage. That wasn't about two people trying to see how we can help each other it, be our authentic self and still be connected. If she says, I'm lonely and scared, and he says, I'm choking, I, I just need to get out. Okay, now we have an authenticity versus connection problem. And both spouses could sit down together and say, okay, I'm lonely and scared. You need to get out. How are we going to work this out? What are we going to do? Let's talk about your feeling choked 
and you need to get out and let's talk about and and maybe they'll they'll they'll, they'll have to come up with something and what i found is almost always uh, if you notice i'm not going to the solution to this problem i'm not telling you this is, some of you might be saying okay so, so what do they do what do they do i don't know i don't know what they do but they do the answer to what they do lies in that marriage Almost always, you know, the couple will look at me and say, okay, so what should we do? And I, I go, I don't know what you should do. You should talk about it. When, when couples talk about it from that place, if they can talk about it from a place of, here, here's the question. The question is, how can I be authentic and connected to you? How can I be authentic and connected to you? Almost always, if you put a couple in that and they stay with that, they'll figure it out. They'll figure it out. They'll make it work. There'll be some kind of compromise. There'll be something that will come out of that. That's, that's the recovery from a fight. And, and, and almost every fight in a marriage can be plugged into, the, into this model that I just said. And if you notice, the key point over here is subjective reality. The key point is subjective reality. Being able to say there's a reality there. Uh, what I experienced was my wife calling me a big baby and telling me I'm not responsible. And in her reality, it, it was just about sadness and loneliness. That can I, can, I, can I make room for that subjective reality? Can I make room for the fact that there is another human being there living inside of a completely different reality than mine? There are people who cannot do that, and that's a problem. And, and if, if that's not possible, if I cannot say we have different realities, most fights in marriages are not resolvable. I need to be able to say there are two realities in this room. A lot of the things that we're talking about here, right, right, so this is the way marriage works, right? We try to do this. There are times when there are fears, there's pain, there are emotions that are just too overwhelming. And, and this doesn't work. And sometimes, sometimes you do need outside help. Sometimes it's, there's a necessity for outside help to, to help somebody realize what they're doing. You, know, you could have marriages, for example, where one, one person just withdraws. One person just is a very common thing in a marriage. Some, somebody just, one person always feels they have to give him because the other one just withdraws. And not, none of this is going to work because one spouse is just, just pulling away. Why, why are they pulling away? What, what's happening over here? Very often, there is something from childhood. There is just a learned behavior from childhood, a fear of confrontation. If I go in and work this out, some, sometimes I've heard spouses say, if I get into a conversation with my spouse, uh, I'll lose, so why, why even bother? I'm just going to pull away. It's, it's, th there could be a thousand reasons why one spouse is withdrawing. Being able to explore that, being able to say, instead of saying something like, what's the matter? Every time we try to have a conversation, you just you pull away. You just shut down and that, that, that's... That's going to make the withdrawal withdraw even more. It's, it, it would be about what's going on here. Are there fears? With compassion, with trying. If one spouse feels, I always have to give in, yeah, there's a problem there. What is it that, I, that makes me always have to give in? What's going on on your side? If, if you cannot do the things that we're talking about, it's very possible you need outside help to do it, which is not, not a big deal. <laughs> It, it, and it shouldn't be a big deal. You know, some, sometimes you just need help making this work. And I, I would just encourage, if the things we're talking about don't work, it just doesn't work. You know, you're, okay, very nice, you're expressing this and it sounds so beautiful, it just doesn't work. When you try this out, it just doesn't work. The things I'm describing to you is what a couples therapist would do in couples therapy and try to help you do. And, and the sooner the better. Um, the... the, the the longer you wait, the more the problems build up. Getting into couples therapy quickly, or, okay, this doesn't work, let's, let's go get help. A anytime something doesn't work, try to get help. And, and usually it's not as complex as you think it is. Um, okay, so what's an example of a potentially unresolvable content discussion? I I'm just gonna run, run through some examples. I want my kids to go to a more modern school, I want my kids to go to a more yeshiva school. Um, I want to build a, a more modest home. I want to build a more expensive home. I think the kids need more discipline. I think the kids need more, more flexibility. 
These, these are things that happen all the time. Each, each one of these has come into my office at least five or six times, each one. Uh, th these are the standard, the Shabbos table needs to be more teredic, the Shabbos table needs to be more chilled. A child needs a therapist, therapists only make things worse. This is, this is what do you do with this? And one thing, one thing that's important to notice about all these is these are perpetual problems. These are not things that are going to go away. I, I quoted last week the Gottman statistic that 70% of disagreements in marriages uh, are unresolvable. It means 70% of the, of the, of the machlag, 70% of the arguments that husbands and wives have never get resolved. So if a husband and wife disagree about something, when they're in the 20s, there is a 70% chance that when they're in their 80s, they will still be fighting about the same thing and still disagree about the same thing. What? How do they disagree in peace? That's what we're going to talk about in a second. The, the first thing, so the first thing is to really, and this 70% statistic, it doesn't make a difference if it's a good marriage or a bad marriage. It's every marriage. This is across the board. You put two people together, they disagree about something, there is a 70% chance that one will not be able to convince the other. So just thinking about that for a moment should change, and this, this to your question, should change our whole approach to what we're doing. Me and my spouse are in a fight. Um, I want a big bar mitzvah, I want to make a small bar mitzvah. I think the kids need more discipline, I think the kids need more flexibility. We're in a fight. We don't agree about this. If the goal of the fight right now, now we just got into a fight about it. I think it should be like this. If the goal of this fight is, and, and couples disagree about these things all the time. I don't care how many discussions you had when you were dating. And you, resol you resolved a hundred issues when you were dating. And you talked it through and you finished the dating process thinking that you are so on the same page with everything. The day after you're married, you'll realize that every day another 10 issues come up that you disagree on, that you never even knew were issues when you were dating. And, and there's so a couple who they discussed on dating that he wanted to, he wanted to learn, and his whole life was about Hashiva Svatayra, and he wanted to learn for a long time. And she was so on board with that, and she was actually excited about that. Until a year into the marriage, she realizes you know, chashivas for Tyra and learning for a long time means forever. No, I thought he was going to go to work after five, six, seven years, like all my siblings. He, uh, he's never, he's never going to go to work? Like, what kind of life are we going to live? And, and they're married a year already, and all of a sudden it just hits. So even the conversations on dating, could be, we could be completely missing each other. You are going to find differences every single day. And 70% of the time, they're not resolvable. Which means... And this is every marriage, by the way. This is not, this is the good marriages. Which means that when, when we get into a fight, when we, not, when we get into a disagreement, if the purpose of, now we have to have a discussion. I want a big bar mitzvah. I want a small bar mitzvah. Now we, now we get into a discussion. If the purpose of this discussion is for one of us to convince the other one, think about this. If the purpose of this discussion is for one of us to convince the other one, there is a 70% chance of failure in this conversation. If that's what we're going for, if that's the main point, what we want is, I want to convince you, now I want to convince you, 70% chance of failure. Why would, why would you do that? Why would we go into such conversations? And the answer is, in good marriages, we don't. And if you'll watch couples in really good marriages, whatever I'm describing now, sometimes people will say to me, come on, people really do this? Is this... A lot of this stuff comes out, the science behind this, comes out of research, mostly by, 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 by Gottman, by John Gottman, where he actually looked at couples in good marriages and looked at couples in bad marriages, was comparing the differences between the two. And what, one of the things he noticed was, oh my gosh, they do this. Look, look what they're doing. Look how they're talking to each other. They, they have these kind of conversations, the, the kind of conversation that I'm going to describe right now. And look at the couples in the bad marriages. Look at the conversations they're having. The couples in the bad marriages were fighting because they were trying to convince each other. The couples in the good marriages were doing something else. What is that something else? Let's pick, let's pick the example of, I want to build a modest home, I want to build a more expensive home. 
Hey, and a couple is fighting about that. They're, they're ready, they're, they're building a home, they just bought a lot and they're ready to build a home. And he really, really wants a, a nice, fancy, expensive home. And she's embarrassed of that, she wants this smaller home and they're fighting. What are, the, what are the lines that are going to go across? If you're trying to convince, now he's trying to convince her, she's trying to convince him. Here's what the conversation is going to sound like. <clears throat> There'll be lines going back and forth like, this is a total waste of money. You're always so busy with what people will say. Just because your parents live like that doesn't mean that we have to. There's no way I'm living in a house like that. And that can go both ways. That could be the small house or the big house. We, we don't have to advertise our money to the world. Why shouldn't we be comfortable if we can afford it? Why, why not? Why not? Why not? I'm not interested in being the only one on the block with a house like that. Every single friend I spoke to says I'm right. That's, that's a big one. I, 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 that, that's... Well, the Rebbe says is another one. But every, every single friend I spoke to says I'm right is... I, I, it's like, and it's so obvious to the person who's saying it, like, of course. And to the one who's hearing it, it's, why in the world would that make a difference to me? Find me one person who agrees with you. What do you, what do you care? Why do I have to suffer just because you want to be a tzaddik? Okay, this is where this conversation goes. Now, now what do you think is going to happen here? They probably will come out one way or the other. They'll, they'll probably come to some solution. Wh whatever solution that they come to, probably they will both end up being resentful because they're probably both going to compromise. Fine, we'll compromise. And the compromise will be something that both of them feel resentful, both of them feel, feel angry about, or they may go to a Rav and the Rav will say, do like this, and then the other one will be fuming. Or the Rav will say, do like that, and the other one will be fuming. If the goal is to convince each other, we're in big trouble. Is, is that the goal? Is that what we're trying to do? Is the goal to convince each other? Every single fight in a marriage has two outcomes. What outcome number one is the thing we're fighting about. And outcome number two is, what is our marriage going to look like for the next 50, 60, 70 years? Every single conversation that a spouse, husband, and wife have is this particular topic we're talking about and what is our life going to be like for the next 60, 70 years? What kind of, what kind of, what kind of relationship do we want to have? And I've seen people fight over chinuch issues. This is fighting over chinuch issues. I think this is more important for my kids, and I think this is more important for the kids, and there's a fight, and there's an ongoing fight over what's best for our kids, and the kids suffer unbelievably because the parents are fighting over what's best for them. And, and that the long-term outcome is this marriage, our children, our home. This is the short-term outcome. This is, what, this, is, this is the home. Now, now, this is a big deal. I'm not, not knocking this. But can we go into this conversation in a completely different way? Why can't you compromise not be resentful? I'm not saying it's part why, of why, if you can compromise without being resentful, that's amazing. Uh, if, if you can do that, then, then that's great. We're talking about issues where you can't. Every, every, there, are, there, are, there are many issues. You know, what kind of challah should we get from the bakery? That might be something that I can compromise without being resentful. I like that challah, you like that challah, fine, you buy that challah. Okay, whatever. You like, you like that cake? I like it. And sometimes, which yeshiva our kids go to? It's that one, that one doesn't make a difference. Whatever. You really like that yeshiva? Fine, they go to that yeshiva. There are issues, I'm talking about issues where we can't. What do we do if we can't? What if it's not resolvable? If an issue is resolvable, if we can talk this through, or if it's one of the 30% that I can convince you, that's great. I'm talking about the 70% that are not resolvable, and it's just too hard to compromise, and we don't know what to do. What if I take a step back and say, okay, there's a 70% chance of failure. The way we're going, there's a 70% chance of failure. What can we do? So, again, I'm going I'm I'm to give you the script. If you can do this, it's amazing. If you find that this just doesn't work, it's just too hard. There's too much stuff inside. It doesn't work. Then you might need somebody, you might need a therapist to help you through this. If there are issues in the marriage... And, and I'm saying this for good marriages also. I've had people come in in really, really, really good marriages, but just got stuck on one issue. And it, and it just couldn't, couldn't be resolved. And it was just a matter of helping them through that process. I'm saying this a bunch of times today because it's, you're hearing things, and if it doesn't work, um, a hopelessness might set in. 
hopefully, you know, it might feel okay. What he's saying just doesn't. Some of you might be listening to this and saying, oh, wow, let's try this. Somebody might be listening and say, that's what we do. And some of you might be listening to this and say, there's no way this can work for us. And then you might even try it and notice that there's no way it can work. If it doesn't work, that doesn't mean you can't do this. It might just, might just mean you need a little bit of help to do it. So here's, here's another approach. The marriage itself. The single most important outcome of any marital conversation is the marital marriage itself. A couple in a happy marriage, if they're fighting over what kind of home we want to build, the way they're lining it up, the way they're lining up the priorities is, yes, we need, here is, here is we need to figure out what home we want to live in. And we can be in a wonderful, beautiful, happy marriage. We have a beautiful friendship. We love each other. We care about each other. But there's no way I'm living in that house. There's no way I'm living in that house. Here's the way that, that argument is. On top of that, as a priority, is our marriage, our friendship, our love. That's the priority. The single most important outcome is the marriage itself. And the question that they're asking is, what will this marriage look like after the conversation is over? Can we go into this conversation in a way that the marriage will actually be better after this conversation? Is that a possibility? Because that's what we want. That's the single most important thing to us. We need to figure this out. But more important than that is our marriage. Will we be, will we be more connected or less connected after this fight? Because we're going we're to have to have a conflict. When this conflict is over, are we more connected or less connected? Couples, and if, if my marriage is a really happy marriage, I want, I want to be more connected after this conflict. Is that possible? Will we be closer to each other or more distant to each other? So let me give you a different conversation. I want to build a more modest home. I want to build a more expensive home. Listen to this couple's conversation. What kind of home did you live in growing up? What did that look like? How did that compare to your friends' homes? What did it feel like living in your home growing up? What, what kind of home did you grow up in? How was money talked about in your home? Your parents had money, your parents didn't have money. What kind of car did they drive? Did the people in the neighborhood have money? How were your parents looked at because they didn't have money? What was your father's relationship to the money? Was he very busy with money? Was it... Which aspects of this are, these are questions that the couple is asking each other. Imagine a couple, husband and wife, sitting together, talking about what kind of home they build, and they're asking about each other. What's going on for you? I see that this home that you want to build, you know, I want to build a really nice, beautiful, fancy home. I want room for our kids. And I see it's, it's really, it's, it's like, you, you, it's really, really bothering you. Or I want to build a more modest home, and I see that you really want that big home. What's, what's going on for you? I really want to understand you. Which aspects of this is, this is a really important question. Which aspects of this are about what people will say and which aspects are about self-expression? You don't want that home. I don't want a home. I, I want a, a nice big home. Do I want a nice big home because, you know, I, I, I just, it gives me a sense of belonging in the world. The neighborhood I live in, everyone has those kind of homes. I want people to think of me a certain way. That would be uh, what people will say, no. Self-expression would be what I need for myself. Maybe I just, I just, I grew up in a tiny home and there was no room and I have a lot of kids and I want the kids to run around more and I want, I want a big basement and I want a big playroom and I, I want my family to be able to come over. Maybe self-expression is the wrong word, but I, I want it for myself. Is that, 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 is it because how, how I want people to see me or is it because of how I want to live? And, and saying it without judgment. I'm not saying, so you want to just everybody should see how you live? And, uh, no, really, th that might be an important thing to you. How people see you, giving you a sense of belonging in the world, might, might, be, might be tied into your house. Is that what it is? Or is there something that you want that, that's over here? And talking about that and helping each other see that. Are there values associated with, this, with the kind of house you, you, you live in? What, what are the values that are going on? Is, is the reason why you want a bigger house or the reason why you want a smaller house connected to some values that you have? Is it, is it, do you have an inherent value not to show off the money? Do you have, what, what's, are there fears associated with not having the house you want? Are you afraid of something? I'm assuming I know why. What? That's assuming, that, that's, that's very good. He, what he said was, that's assuming I know why. Very often coming into this conversation, you don't know why. And when you start having this conversation, you start learning why. 
You start learning about yourselves. If somebody says to you, are there values attached to this? Are there fears associated with this? You have to step in and think. Now, the way the questions are being asked is with real curiosity. I really want to understand you better. If I start talking to you and I say, I really want to understand you better, are you afraid? Are there, you're going to have to look inside yourself to find those answers. So I'm going to learn about you and you're going to learn about you. What other feelings are coming up for you in this conversation? Like we're talking about this. And maybe you're feeling, uh-oh, I, I might have to give in. Uh, are you feeling embarrassment, anger, loneliness, sadness? All these, all these emotions can come up in the size of, and the kind of house that we, that, we want, that, we want to, that we want to build. Are there memories that come up for you in this conversation? Is there any childhood stuff that's coming up for you here? Are there dreams associated with having the house that you want? Getting into each other's dreams. That, that question is such an important question. Having this kind of house or having this kind of house can be very associated with, with dreams that I have. When I, when the, the term dreams here means when I was a little kid, I always grew up, I always saw myself like this. This is something I'm holding on to for, for 20 years, 30 years, and, and now this, it's just all going to come crashing down. And the dream in this case could be both. I, I could have a dream of living a really modest, humble, to me, mistake a life. And then this house is just, it's just shattering that dream. Or maybe I had a dream of not being crunched into this little tiny house that I grew up in and having my house that my kids could just run around and feel free. And, and that was my dream. And now my dream is going to be crushed because my... What, what are the dreams? What, what are you losing over here? How is your sense of self impacted by the type of home you live in? We're talking about a home. Do you see what's happening over here? We're talking about a home... And all of a sudden, we're not talking about a home anymore. We're talking about each other. We're learning more about each other. We're getting to know each other. We're getting to know ourselves. How is your sense of belonging impacted by the type of home you live in? That's a big one. If you live in a small home, you live in a big home, that, that might massively impact your, your whole sense of belonging. Because who do I want to belong to? What's my crowd? Who do I want to be? Do I want to be that crowd? Do I be that? And sense of belonging is, again, this needs to be done from a place of compassion, not from a place of, yeah, you're just, you're just doing it for your friends. No, maybe, yeah, maybe I am doing it for my friends, but friends are important to me. And, and, uh, and, and I, I, want, I want that sense of belonging, and that really is important to me. But may, maybe my sense of importance is attached to a smaller house, because I don't, I don't want to be seen as somebody with a big fancy house. <laughs> At the end of this conversation, you know, this conversation was not, was nobody was trying to convince anybody else. Notice that there was no convincing going on. And remember, if there's a 70% chance of failure, why go there? I'm not going to convince you. What I'm after is, I want to understand you better. I want you to understand me better. I want to understand myself better. I want you to understand yourself better. When this conversation is over, now, now some of you may be thinking, okay, very nice. What, what, what kind of house are we building? Like, <laughs> let's say, tachlis. Uh, and the answer to that is, I don't know. I really don't know. But I've watched couples go through this. I've watched couples go through this kind of conversation. And what comes out, what, what happens here is, at the beginning of the conversation, it's unresolvable. It's unresolvable because the relationship is in a certain place. Our understanding of each other is in a certain place. We have a certain view of the situation. We're in a box. We're, we're closed up in a box and it's completely unresolvable. When you have a conversation like this, our relationship expands. Our knowledge of each other expands. Our knowledge of each other expands. When this conversation is over, first of all, we're much closer. The, the relationship became closer. And the conversation becomes a very different conversation. It becomes an extremely different conversation. Now, some of you are waiting to hear, so what kind of house are they going to build? I don't know, but they will know. If, if they can follow through with this conversation, they will know. Now, what makes this conversation so hard is I need, I need a certain outcome. Like, as you're going through this, your mind is saying, yeah, okay, but, but, but what kind of house are we going to have? What kind of house are we going to have? That part needs to be put on the side for this conversation. That is so hard. And again, some couples can do this. Some couples need help to do this. 
But this is what has to happen. This is what we mean when we say resolving the unresolvable. It's unresolvable. It's not resolvable. And, it, and it's, very well, it's very possible that you will never change your mind, you will never change your mind. And when you're 95 years old and the grandchildren come and say, what kind of house should we build? The wife will say, build a big fancy home, and the husband will say, no, build a small modest home, or vice versa. Nothing changed. What the change is, we understand each other better, we love each other more, we, we, and we're gonna make a decision what kind of home to build from a completely different place than when we started this conversation. What decision will we make? Again, I don't know. But we will make this place, and I've watched this process over and over again, and it, it, it's, it's mind-boggling how well it works. If I can guide a couple through this kind of a conversation, they come out the other side of the conversation in a completely different way. And I don't even have to help them make a decision. They, they, just, kind of, they just kind of feel their way through it. And yeah, there's probably a compromise that's gonna have to happen. Or one person will give in to the other person, but not from a place of whatever but from a place of, okay, we understand each other. I understand your pain, you understand my pain, I understand your dreams, you understand my dreams. Let's see what it, it what emerges from this is we, it, the decision, instead of being me against you, becomes what are we gonna do? It, be, it, it goes into a place of we. It's based on compassion? When we have a conversation like this, we go to a place of compassion. We become more and more compassionate to each other. There's, there's, a, there's a willingness now to compromise that, that wasn't there before. Because I understand myself better, I understand you better. You notice the second couple had no criticism, no defensiveness, no contempt, no stonewalling, no trying to solve the problem, and no trying to convince you that I'm right and you're wrong. That was missing totally from that conversation. At the end, we'll have to figure this out, but that wasn't what the conversation was. What's left? What's left? If I can't criticize, be defensive, stonewall, what, 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 what else is there to do? Can I talk about all my thoughts, beliefs, and feelings on this issue? And can I explain why this is so important to me? Can I listen to all your thoughts, beliefs, and feelings on this issue? And can I really try to understand what makes this so important to you? I want to know why this is so important to you. And you want to know why this is so important to me. Can I, and, and can I make it safe for you to express whatever you need to express? Let's just talk about this. One part of this is, I, I want to make a differentiation between, and, and I guess we'll, we'll kind of end with this, with this thought. With this, this plays a big role in this. There are, I'll express it this way, very often I, I've gotten a question more than once, qu quite a few times, a question coming from somebody 28, 29, 30, 35, who's single. And a shidduch is being read. And it's not what they wanted. And the question is, so where do you compromise? With, like, what should I give up? What should I not give up? I'm 33 years old, and should I be giving up this? Should I be giving up that? And I, I believe the answer to that is, it's, it's a very simple answer, but actually actualizing it might take a lot of thought. The answer is you need to differentiate between dreams and values. A value is something that's really, really, really important to me because I value it. A dream is usually something that flows out of a value. Right? So let's say I have a value, a family. Family is really important to me. And I'm being read a shidduch now. Somebody is, you know, somebody who's really, it seems like really good, but, but the family is very dysfunctional. I really won't have a family. You know, she doesn't have, he doesn't have a family, she doesn't have a family. There's no, there's no, there's no family there. That's not, that's not really what I wanted. Because family is such a value for me, I wanted somebody who comes with a family. I wanted a mother-in-law, father-in-law, sister-in-law, brother-in-law, and it's just not gonna happen. What's the dream, what's the value? Family is a value. Because I have a value of family, I had certain dreams that were attached to that, right? Looking at it in other areas, you know, let's say I have, not in marriage, let's say I have a, dr a value of chashivas uh, you know, learning Torah is, is really, really, really important to me. And I have a dream to finish Shas, right? Finishing Shas is not a value, it's a dream. Life circumstances may force me to give up that dream. 
but does that mean I'm giving up the value? So my answer to, to people in this situation is sometimes you might have to give up a dream. It's, it's a very, it's a sad answer. I, 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 you know, it's, it's, a pain, it's a painful answer to say to somebody. It's really painful. But sometimes you might have to give up a dream. There are dreams that you might have to let go of. And, and the truth is in life we always let go of dreams. Moving on in life very often means letting go of dreams. Values is a whole different story. And what I would tell a person in that situation is, what are you giving up? If you were to marry this girl, she doesn't have the things you want. You marry this guy, she doesn't have the things you want. Are you giving up dreams? Maybe. You have to sit down and think that you might have to let go of certain dreams. Are you giving up values? Don't give up values. Don't, don't give up your values. Values are really, really, really important. Um, if you look at this circle, when couples are talking to each other, we've, we've, had this, we've had this conversation and now we're trying to make it work. A big part, I use the word core needs and areas of flexibility. Um, those are John Gottman's words. This, this actually comes out right out of his work. Um, but I, 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 the words that I would put in here are values for core needs and, and dreams as area of flexibility. When we're talking, now I really, really understand you. I really understand you. What are we looking for? What am I looking for in myself? And what am I looking for in you? What are the dreams? And, 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 and what are the values? Where can we compromise? If I have to compromise on a value, that, that's a core need. It's really going to be hard. If I have to compromise on a dream, maybe I do. And understanding each other also means understanding what are my dreams, what are my values, what are your dreams, what are your values. When we understand that clearly, again, th it becomes a little bit more easier because, yeah, sometimes we have to give up dreams and it's hard and sad. But I, I really don't want to give up my values and I don't want you to give up your values. What you'll notice when you, when you have a conversation like this, I, I've noticed this all the time, when a couple is fighting over something, over big house, little house, very rarely are they fighting over values. They think they are. If they have, a, what's, about with your, what's with your values, what's with your values, if they really have this conversation honestly and look into themselves and look into their spouse, what you'll find is that, let's say in the, the example of the big house, small house, it's not about we have different values. Most of the time, not always, but most of the time, if you go through this conversation carefully, you'll find, you know, our values are really the same. We just, we just have different ways of expressing it. We, we attach different dreams to our values. The many chinuch um, arguments, we think we're arguing in values, but when they really, really talk it through, they really want the same thing for their kids. But I think I'm going to get this for my kids this way, and I'm thinking I'm going to get it, but they want the same thing. So are we really, really, so it, part of the conversation is, take a step back and try to help each other. It's not, it's not an easy thing to pull apart. What's a dream? What's a value? But try to help each other. You're doing this together. You're in this together. Try to help each other talk this through. Okay, what are our dreams? What are our values? The Yeshiva.net.